Hello, everybody. Yeah, we, got, we, we have a good crowd for John's uh, second talk. It's very exciting. This is the first year that uh, John will be talking twice. A um, couple things to, um, uh, to know. John will talk for, for about an hour or so, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. The mic is right there. That's actually just right there. And um, uh, so just line up uh, when we get to the questions. Try to keep your questions on what John talked about. If you get up and ask when Doom 4 is coming out, I'm going to kick you in the knee. So right there. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I will uh, not waste any more time, but you guys in the back, because John's going to write on the board, uh, and we have plenty of empty seats here, you can, you can file in, it's, it, it, you know, don't worry that there's reserved seats there, just go ahead and sit in them. Um, all right, I will uh, give you guys uh, Mr. Carmack. Okay. Okay, so I guess this is sort of going to be like a schoolroom session. I had deluded myself for a little while that this would be the first talk where I ever actually made slides to present, but it didn't actually come to pass, so it's going to be notes and talking and some scribbling on the board again. So mo almost all of what we do in game development is really more about artistry. It's about trying to appeal to people, but there's the small section of the small section of what goes into the games that's drawing the pictures on the screen that you can at least make some ties to the you know, the hardest of hard sciences. And while, you know, it's great that people are researching the psychology and the different ways that people think about compulsion loops and some of these other game design topics, uh, the raw physics that goes into rendering uh, just kind of goes through the heart of physics where, you know, it goes through the kind of the all-star list of physics with Newton's optics and Maxwell's equations and Einstein's relativity. And it's kind of neat to think that this is sort of brought to bear in the, the techniques that go into sort of making the games that we play. So at the, start, at the start, you think, well, okay, we see light, so what actually is light? And we've got a definition now that light's the sliver of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can actually perceive, but that has a really long and complicated history for how we sort of reach that conclusion and how it's not really as clear-cut as most people would like, you know, would like it to be. Uh, you know, optical research started kind of all the way back with a lot of the Greek philosophers, but uh, Newton did a whole lot of work with breaking light up with prisms, seeing how white light was actually composed of all the different colors of the spectrum, and they add together to make what we perceive as light. Uh, and then for, there was a centuries-long debate about whether light was a particle, like this little tiny billiard ball, these photons that you shoot out, or a wave effect, like all the things that you see in waves in water and waves in matter, so on. And, Finally, we reach the conclusion that, well, it's a wave-particle duality of, that quantum mechanics talks about. And this is very unsatisfying when you begin looking at this, uh, but it's really pretty much irrefutable. There are these straightforward experiments that can be done to show that you look at it one way, it's a wave, you look at it another way, it's a light, uh, or it's a, a particle. So, Luckily for computer graphics, we hardly care at all about that. Only when you start looking at some aspects of surface reflectance models do you start caring at all about some of these quantum mechanical properties of light. For the most part, we can look at light as zillions and zillions of little billiard balls shot out from lights and bouncing off of things and eventually reaching our eyes so that we can perceive them. I, there's a lot of simplifications that, well, that have to happen when you, when you talk about simulating this. The, uh, there's a lot of engineering disciplines like thermal management, uh, radio engineering that do simulations of the electromagnetic spectrum, just other parts of it, how they, they bounce around, interact with things. And this is done all the time and it works. It really is science. So you can say rendering an image or deciding how much light reaches a particular area is about as basic of a science as it comes. There's not a, any artistic measure in here. There are tons of other aspects once you get into perception that do become questions about, well, maybe there is artistry that goes into producing something when you've got an impression that you want. But when you're talking about simulating an environment, which most of what we do in sort of the hardcore FPS type games is we, we are pretending that we've got this virtual world and we're running a camera through it and we're trying to simulate what's happening in various ways. And nowadays, we know what we would have to do to make that almost perfect. We just have nowhere near the, the computing capacity to do uh, really, really high-level simulations. 
but we can trace it's useful even if you're not going to do the right thing to at least understand what the right thing is and then understand which trade-offs you're making and make them with sort of a clear head rather than accidentally backing into trade-offs that may or may not be really the best way to, to go about things. So, so many that it took a long time for people to realize that these other phenomena, things like radio waves, and there's a lot of confusion in 19th and 20th century physics about like which things were particles and which things were rays, and we still have kind of mixed up terminology when you talk about cosmic rays that are actually particles, and you talk about uh, you know alpha radiation and beta radiation and these things that are particle based rather than being rays from the electromagnetic spectrum. But we use this stuff all the time for radio waves. I, you know, your Wi-Fi has two gigahertz I, you know, uh, frequencies. You know, the, uh, the visible light rays are up in the, you know, the terahertz range, many terahertz. I, but they're basically the same thing. They just differ in how they interact with matter. They're produced in somewhat similar ways, but the different things change. They behave differently when they interact with other uh, things based on their wavelength, which is why X-rays can shoot through things, radio waves can go through some things that, that visible light pretty much bounces off of. So another important critical thing really is that photons, the, the little bundles of light that we talk about, they are absolutely quantized. It's again part of the, the quantum weirdness that you can't send off this arbitrarily divisible amount, but there is a, an almost unbelievably large number of them. You know, given light that's throwing out is, you know, I can just say zillions with a straight face because it's a very large scientific notation number. It's not trillions, it's not quadrillions, it's even more than that that are coming out in terms of these bundled little uh, quanta of energy. Uh, now, they do have characteristics to them. If we treat them as the little billiard balls, in computer graphics, we are generally looking at only a few different spectrums, of, a few different wavelengths in the spectrum of light. And that has to do with an aspect of the human visual system. While there are this incredibly divisible spectrum of light that goes out, we're only susceptible to three sort of styles of light, and they're not even individual frequencies. That's why we can get by with red, green, and blue for, uh, for our monitors' emissive spectrums, because we only have three types of color receptors in our eyes. And I often think how it would be really interesting if you could look at all of these other spectrums bouncing around, and that's what thermal imaging and some of these other things let you sort of get a peek into it. And that's only light that's very, that's EM radiation that's very close to the visible spectrum, the infrared. Uh, it, would, it would be much more bizarre and interesting to be able to visualize radio waves in a real-time space, to like see all the multi-path that's causing your Wi-Fi to be weird in specific ways, why you know, moving something over here causes the, uh, you know, the, the radiation to change so much at your antenna to make a difference in your reception strength. And these are all things that, that have a bearing to what you do with light transport, as well as other wave phenomena like audio, like really, really high-end audio processing is the exact same thing as what we treat light processing. Uh, you send out energy, it bounces off of all sorts of things in the world, and eventually arrives at something that's going to perceive it, which would be your ears in that case versus your eyes. So to kind of start with the, the path of a photon, of what it would take, I, you've got something creates the, the photon, and for the longest time in our human existence, about the only thing that we saw creating photons was a great deal of heat. Uh, you heat things up hot enough, and photons start coming off of them. You heat it up enough, it starts glowing a dull red. You heat it up more, it starts getting more yellowish and towards white, as more and more of the colors of the spectrum are emitted from these uh, uh, hot things. And obviously, the sun is a very hot thing, where you've got a fusion reactor going, and the, uh, the light that comes off of that is all of these, uh, these atoms giving up some energy. So photons carry energy away from uh, where they came from. And this is uh, radiative, uh, radiative heat transfer, where something gets hot. If you leave it all by itself there, it glows, and it eventually stops glowing. It cools down, going down through the spectrum, getting cooler and cooler, until you don't see any visible light, because it's actually lost much of its heat. Uh, on Earth, radiative heat transfer is the least effective form of heat transfer. You get much more from conduction, where it just kind of goes through the actual physical contact 
uh, in, into other areas as the heat spreads out, or convection where moving currents of air or water take the heat away. But in space, radiation is the only way you lose heat. And in aerospace engineering, this is extremely important. Things like the areas like the International Space Station and spaceships, they have to worry a whole lot about thermal management because the only tool they've really got is radiation. You see, you see these enormous solar panels where they collect solar energy, but a lot of space vehicles have to have enormous radiators where they actually let the energy go, you know, go out from the vehicle, otherwise they would get hotter and hotter. So the, uh, it's important to note that even if it's not glowing so that we can see it, everything's still radiating. So you don't see the space station glowing red hot, it's just glowing at whatever its normal temperature is, which can be perceived with infrared sensors, but it slowly loses energy and it eventually reaches a balance. That's why something stuck out in the sun in space doesn't get hotter and hotter. Eventually it reaches the point where the light that's coming in and hitting it is equaled by the radiation that's leaving it. And there are, uh, like you can make, uh, we've made rocket engines that are radiatively cooled where they burn 5,000 degrees or so inside and they get so blindingly white hot on the outside that all of the energy that's not going out the nozzle that's soaking into the walls is radiated away as a whole lot of light. And this is essentially what old style incandescent light bulbs were. You had a tungsten filament, you made it really hot by pushing electrons through it, and it got hot enough and it started glowing. And if you watched closely, if it was a very, like a heavy filament, you could watch it warm up or especially shut down. It would go through, kind of ramp through the temperatures. You would see it be red and get up to white hot, and then when you shut it down, it would cool down through yellow and then back through red before finally settling. Uh, settling back to radiating in non-visible regions at sort of room temperature eventually. Nowadays, we have a lot more efficient ways to create photons with uh, fluorescence and LEDs, things that are tuned carefully to just barely nudge the, uh, the electrons in the atoms out to an excited state, let them collapse back down and spit a photon out. For the most part, photon emission is random in terms of which direction it goes. When you look at radio engineering, there's huge bodies of literature for antenna design that determine how you can make, make it slightly stronger or weaker in different directions, but there's still a very fundamental nature of randomness, which is, again, the quantum mechanics aspect of things. There is, at a, at a very low level, natural events are completely random, and you can't just say, I only want photons that are come out, gonna come out of the left side of this material. So you get a photon that pops off in some random direction, uh, it may go straight for, if it's coming from a distant star, it could go straight for trillions of miles, more or less just traveling through space. There's little bits of general relativity with uh, you know, warping of light that can happen, but for the most part, it can continue on indefinitely. It's a self-propagating wave. So it pops off of some atom somewhere, maybe flies through space for a billion trillion miles or something, comes in, finally hits our Earth's atmosphere, and then starts interacting with the atmosphere in some way. Every change in density that uh, visible light goes through will, re uh, will result in it bending its path somewhat. This is called refraction. Uh, the most obvious case when you look at it is things like prisms and lenses where you can see the light really strongly warped. But it happens in any, you know, any sort of density change, going from the vacuum of space to the outer reaches of our atmosphere, and then every change in, uh, in pressure or temperature changes the density, and that causes very slight and subtle movements of the changes in the direction of the light. Uh, and this is actually why stars twinkle out at night. If you're on a clear night and you see stars coming in from billions or trillions of miles away. It's going completely straight till it hits the upper atmosphere, and then it may slightly deviate, just tiny fractions of degrees, and this can cause the, the very small number of photons that you're seeing there to kind of come and go or move around in different ways. Uh, but the most important thing for, from a computer graphics standpoint are the effects that happen when it hits more solid matter, solid surfaces, or even liquid surfaces, and that's where uh, it has the opportunity to, to generally, well, it can be, even gas, you can wind up having the case of absorbing the photon. Uh, this happens rarely in gas. You can pass through hundreds of miles of atmosphere and not have too many of the photons absorbed, uh, but it happens very rapidly in, uh, in matter, in solid matter. Uh, the, 
A typical photon, when it hits a surface, might penetrate a little bit into it. A surface like metal will bounce off of just the first several atoms. It doesn't take many molecules or many atoms of,、uh, of metal before you can reflect light out, which is why you can make these super enormous space mirrors that are just a very tiny sputtering of aluminum on some plastic film, and they can actually. Make solar sails or giant solar collectors and concentrators. But for most other materials, the light can penetrate a little bit further into it.、Uh, as it interacts with the molecules, it can either be absorbed, raising the temperature a little bit,、uh, going into eventually heat, making it hotter so that it starts radiating out, radiating out at some level. Or it can redirect the photon in some way. You've got the minor redirections from the refraction. And much stronger ones when it interacts and bounces off of a solid surface. Now, there's a ton of different names. There's literally a couple dozen different names for the different ways that light can interact with surfaces. There's all the different types of scattering,、uh, of course, reflection, re reflection, refraction.、Uh, reflection can be split up into specular reflection, diffuse reflection. And there's all sorts of different subcategories. I mean, optics is a huge topic. There are societies dedicated to you know, every aspect of it, and there's huge terminologies for all of it. But for the most part, you can say a photon comes in. If it's not absorbed, it's going to be kicked out some other direction,、uh, and then it can go and interact potentially with the atmosphere or potentially with another surface. And eventually, it's either absorbed, well, eventually it is absorbed somewhere, but for the most part, they're absorbed into the surfaces around us. But a tiny, tiny fraction of all the photons that are bouncing around eventually hits our eyes. And even when it gets to our eyes, which are mostly transparent, there's this chance that the photon hits and it specularly reflects off of our eye. And you know, it made it all the way out of the billions of possible traces, made it to my eye, and then decides to specularly reflect off some other direction. But Most of it that hits the eye and hits the lens gets through, propagates through、uh, you know, the vitreous and aqueous humor and all the little biological parts of the eye, and hits receptors in the back of our eyeballs that turn those eventually into neural impulses that our brain works with. Now, our eyes can actually be quite sensitive. The,、uh, the rods, the non color sensitive part of our eyes, When they're fully dark adapted, if you've been staying outside for,、uh, in a dark area for 20, 30 minutes, single photons can cause chemical reactions to happen in the, you know, inside the rod cells. It takes a handful of them, a couple dozen, for it to turn into a neural impulse. But it is possible for people that, especially in the old days, people watching for things on ships in、uh, moonless nights that might be out all night with nothing but faint starlight. You can have cases of just handfuls of photons coming off of something being registered and showing up and people、uh, acknowledging their existence, which is pretty amazing when you think about these incredible subatomic particles, not even particles, but incredible, the scope of that being detectable by us as biological entities. And、uh, there are limits to the,、uh, what you can wind up detecting with light.、Uh, light has, the visible light that we see has a wavelength, and you can't really deal with things that are smaller than that, which is why you're never going to have a real picture of an atom or a molecule, because those are much, much smaller than,、uh, you know, than the wavelengths of light.、Uh, you eventually use electron microscopes and then scanning tunneling microscopes and these other things that don't deal with light at all to take those. Super tiny pictures, like the,、uh, the Boy and His Atom movie that IBM Research did, which was done with a little raster grid of, of atoms, which is really, in the fundamental sense of the word, deeply awesome that we are dealing with matter, you know, the very constituents of everything at that level, and we can make a little, a little movie out of it.、Uh, but those pictures have nothing to do with light, nothing to do with rendering, and, the, and basically the, the techniques that I'm talking about here.、Uh, that's a completely different way of sensing what's going on. At that level. So,、uh, to recap the, the basic pictures of this, you've got you know, something, a sun up here, spits out some light, travels through space, gets to the atmosphere on the Earth, maybe bends a little bit, maybe just goes straight through, comes down, hits a surface, maybe gets absorbed, maybe hits something else. You've got walls and rooms and bouncing around in there, and eventually, if we're seeing it, reaches somebody's eyeball. Inside. And that's the physics of what happens. It's really well understood. It does come down to a lot of data acquisition and characterization. When you talk about how the, the critical interactions with the surfaces, when you've got your basic theoretical thing, if you talk about a flat surface, you say light comes in, 
what happens to it? That's the question of surface response. If you have a perfect mirror, and, and it's worth noting that to be 